Genis is a firm that has been around for 25 years and has a very distinguished uh, reputation. Um, and I think it is a real signal when a firm like Genis is basically willing to back this stuff um, with their capital, both their financial capital uh, and also their reputational capital. I think it's really, uh, it says a lot about the firm, but it also really says a lot uh, about where the investment world is going, and I and I just have to say I love that sustainability is now being plugged into the traditional uh, financial model, even in the non-product uh, uh, sector addressing this stuff. Um, and then I also would be remiss if I didn't point out that there are a few big names here, and I'm sure there's others, um, but there are literally two people in the audience, uh, Deb Abbey, and, and, uh, who's the executive director or CEO um, of the Responsible Investment Organization in Canada, and Peter Chapman, who is with SHARE, who's an organization many of you will know, who are literally the pioneers uh, of the uh, responsible investing movement, and also uh, Deb has with her her colleague from Toronto, uh, Dustin. And then uh, in the impact investing world, uh, we all, of course, as investors, rely on where to deploy capital to. And we have Mike Rollins, uh, who is deeply connected uh, here in, well, in Canada uh, in the uh, social enterprise community. So really nice to see the kind of crowd that uh, Genesis is able to draw out. OK, so I was going to say a bit about purpose capital, uh, of course, uh, and, uh, and then speak a bit about the social finance spectrum. Uh, responsible investing within it, impact investing, and then a bit more about uh, specifically on impact investing uh, on sort of strategy, deployment, product uh, to give people a better notion uh, of the space. Uh, so Purpose Capital. Uh, so we're an impact investing advisory firm, uh, principally out of Toronto, but I'm here, uh, that mobilizes forms of capital to accelerate social change. So principally financial capital, but looking at all of the capitals of organizations um, uh, to, to, to basically uh, mobilize or uh, deploy leverage. Um, and we have two practice areas, the applied innovation practice, which is really working with governments and large sector leading organizations to develop uh, products, platforms, markets, sort of the large scale infrastructure type pieces that are needed uh, to move forward the impact investing uh, world. And then what I'm going to talk today about is more uh, focused around the investment advisory practice, which is really working with investors, high net worth um, individuals, families, foundations, credit unions, the major banks, um, to design and deploy impact investing strategies. Just going to throw up a very busy slide that captures just a general sense of the kind of clients. And it's not just because it'll give you an insight into purpose capital, but also it gives you a bit of a sense of the type of scope um, that the impact investing world um, encompasses. Uh, purpose Capital did a, a major uh, research report for TD Bank uh, 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 um, uh, on kind of the, the state of play in the social impact uh, investing space. Um, um, addressing affordable housing uh, with the City of London, so there's municipal work happening in this world. Uh, Co-working is a major area where an organization has a real estate asset that they want to deploy for, for social purpose. Um, Recode is a big project uh, working with McConnell Foundation to launch a nationwide uh, network and fund uh, to establish innovative ecosystems on university campuses across the country. Uh, so funding folks like Radius Ventures, who's here in Vancouver and uh, is an accelerator, um, social enterprise accelerator program connected to um, SFU. Uh, and then the more traditional, what I'm talking about here today, really the impact investment uh, advisory work, which is helping foundations like Inspirit or the uh, Immigrant uh, Access Loan Fund uh, develop strategies um, around impact investing and also deployment, uh, the social finance spectrum. Um, it can be described in many ways, but this is one way to, to think about it. You've got traditional finance on the side, which is really except for Genis, who has the, the you know, sustainability metric plugged in, <laughs> traditionally doesn't look uh, at ESG factors, uh, really. You've got responsible investing, um, where you've got ESG, so environmental, social, governance. That would include human rights, health and safety, these types of, of um, risks, really looked at in a risk framework. So they're core to the product, they're core to the analysis, uh, but they may, but they're more under the auspices of, of a risk piece. Um, and you see players uh, like the pension funds, for example, uh, taking up uh, some of this uh, analysis. 
Then you've got socially responsible investment products, of which apparently we have 61 of them in Canada. Um, uh, who knew? Um, and uh, there, we talk sometimes in language about positive and negative screening. Uh, but and and other strategies like shareholder engagement. And I'm just going to speak about those in a minute, um, a bit more. But essentially, the values piece is is central. So it's the same environmental, social, and governance risk uh, um, analysis. But instead of being positioned as a risk tool, um, how it's going to affect share price, it is also positioned as people wanting to have uh, portfolios and deploy their personal financial capital uh, in ways uh, which mirror their values. Um, and those tend to be in the mutual fund space, for example. Then you move into really the core of what would be considered impact investing, starting with maybe thematic funds, impact first, where people are really looking first at the impact piece. And if there's a financial benefit, that's great, but they're not necessarily setting out uh, to, to capture a market or above market return per se. And then venture philanthropy, um, is funding that can go all the way, almost to the point of gifting, where there's really a seeding um, of, of social enterprise, which may or may not have a return, and that is not the primary uh, driver. So with responsible investing, and I've got uh, responsible investing associations slide, there are many definitions. I don't think you can read this, and I can almost hardly read my own, but it goes by many names. It gets, uh, the term gets used a lot. It can be really broadly capture uh, many areas. I'm just going to rattle these off here. So ethical investing is a term you may hear. Uh, socially responsible investing, sustainable investing, green investing, community investing, mission-based investing, and then some people also uh, roll in uh, impact investing broadly. And I was going to speak really to the, the SRI piece, so the socially responsible investing piece, where it really is a, mirror, a matching of the value uh, and the values piece. You're wanting uh, a competitive return, um, but also a values-based uh, approach to, to money management. And that's where a lot of the, the play players are in the retail space. So individuals can, can go out and invest in these products. And they tend to employ uh, a number of, of there, are, there are differences between the strategies they use, but the fundamental strategies are screening, so deciding what is or isn't in the portfolio uh, based on this environmental, social, and governance analysis. Some people refer, it in, refer to it, break it down into positive screening, um, seeking out uh, investments that have a higher ESG uh, profile, preferential ESG profile, or negative screening, setting the bar and saying certain things aren't going to get in because they have companies have uh, uh, environmental performance that falls below a certain threshold, uh, or they invest in certain industries like tobacco or nuclear, um, and so that's really screening, making decisions about what gets included in the portfolio. The other really important strategy. Uh, is engagement. And that also breaks out into a couple of uh, key areas. So as a shareholder, so an individual person can be a unit holder in a mutual fund, and then the mutual fund has, holds these shares. And as a shareholder, there are certain rights that come along with that. The first is voluntary, which is that companies are very sensitive to, um, to dialoguing with credible uh, shareholders and um, I mean stakeholders in general but but shareholders do play a special role in the stakeholder uh, realm with companies um, and so companies SRI companies regularly engage or the good ones do uh, regularly engage with companies um, either on their own or using firms like share uh, to do it for them uh, to dialogue with companies to go to the table say we're shareholders we're concerned about these emerging environmental social governance risks um, and it can be anything from uh, you know, within environment, it can be, you know, energy transitions. How can a company demonstrate that they're moving towards a, you know, a realistic uh, energy transition future? Um, environmental social. Social might be human rights. How are they uh, mitigating uh, risk, for example, in a mining acquisition if they've acquired a project and it's had some legacy issues of problems on the ground and how is the company now going to improve the record, uh, bringing it into the fold of their own company? Or governance might be, um, you know, are they, do they have a diverse board that uh, that is able to grapple with the challenges uh, that the company faces in the future. Um, so that's the dialogue piece. Uh, dialogue often is very compelling to companies, and I, I'm a great believer that dialogue has resulted in, you know, there has been movement in corporate Canada as a result of the socially responsible investment community uh, engaging companies. 
It is, of course, uh, voluntary. The work is voluntary, whether the companies uh, take heed of what investors are saying. Uh, and so often you get com uh, SRI firms then going to the next step, which can be resolutions. As a shareholder, you have a right to file a resolution, uh, get it on the agenda, uh, and have other shareholders uh, see what they think about it. So you might put forward a resolution saying you want to see greater transparency on carbon risk, for example, from the company, or any number of resolutions. Um, a lot of this work in socially responsible investing tends to be quite telling um, about the jurisdiction in which it's happening. So there's a lot of differences, for example, uh, around the world in how sort of SRI plays out in Canada versus the US and versus uh, Europe. So for example, uh, stepping back to screening, I'm just thinking, you know, for example, in Canada you, or in the US, let's say, you would have SRIs that might not invest in, uh, in alcohol. And of course, in France, this would be unheard of. Um, <laughs> uh, and then in the <laughs> engagement <laughs> and then in the engagement world, similarly the US they tend to love the sort of you know the good guys and the bad guys and the conflict and you know showing up at the AGMs and it being very splashy. Whereas Canada tends to be a much more constructive behind the scenes dialogue, much less media driven, much more really companies and investors sitting down and, and getting stuff done. Um, and not that there's not value in both in raising profile of issues through a splashy campaign as well, um, but Canada tends to have fewer resolutions, I would say, and it's not because Canada's a, any less active in engagement. It just tends to favor a certain set uh, of tactics here that I think uh, speaks to the culture a bit. Um, and then there is, of course, proxy voting, which is a little bit of a uh, less glamorous piece, but SRI firms are voting thousands of voting uh, proxies a year. Basically, the, the, you know, the votes that decide who gets to be on the board and what resolutions are supported and all these other factors, plus really important decisions like who gets to be the auditor and stuff like that. And so SRIs are very diligent uh, in really voting those, not just voting with management, but really being thoughtful and using their proxy voting, not only with the power of the tool of the vote, um, but also in making uh, that work transparent to encourage others to be thinking through how they would like to vote in a more uh, intentional way as opposed to just voting with management. Um, and then the final piece, which not everybody does, but I think is really important, uh, is standards work, and that is working with anyone who can, has the power to make something non-mandatory for a company. So, so improving ESG standards through regulators, various levels of governments, industry associations, uh, and the like. And so the good SRIs in Canada uh, you know, are doing that work as well. So impact investing gets also defined in many ways. But I think a, a good basic definition is, in contrast to SRI, that it's directing capital uh, more, in a much more, it's, it's deploying capital in a much more direct way to local or international investment opportunities that aim to address specific social or environmental issues. Um, so it tends to be much more small scale. Uh, it's across a range of asset classes, sectors, regions, um, and it's different but complementary to responsible investing. And asset classes uh, include cash, cash equivalents, uh, private debt, I'd say there's six asset classes that get signaled out, uh, so cash, pri uh, cash equivalent, private debt, public debt, public equity, private equity and venture capital. And there are examples in Canada of uh, definitely all f five of those six, and one is a little bit uh, debatable, which I'll <laughs> speak to. But essentially, um, the last I saw, there was about 45 uh, products in Canada that which were impact investment, uh, as, impact investing uh, products specifically. And I'm just going to mention one in each of those asset classes. Uh, so on the cash side, uh, for example, folks might be here familiar with the Van City Resilient Capital Program, which is really a, a, a deposit product um, that funds uh, high impact social enterprise, so cash equivalent. Uh, private debt, um, there's something called the St. John's uh, Community Loan Fund, which would be probably a less, uh, a, a less familiar here. Um, but, and similarly, it's funding social enterprises uh, in, in the region in New, in New Brunswick. Uh, public debt, an example, and I've kind of drawn examples from across the country. Uh, public debt uh, is, uh, an example would be the Toronto Community Housing. Uh, it, that's a bond issuance um, from the municipality. Uh, private equity, there's a, a fund called Capital for Aboriginal Prosperity and Entrepreneurship. 
Um, and so the private equity piece is more high risk, uh, for example, um, and more long term, the investments, uh, I would say. And that's for, inst uh, that's for institutional and private investors, so accredited investors. Uh, public equity is the one where it's a bit debatable. Some people say there are no public equity products. Uh, and it depends where you're drawing the line between SRI and, and impact. I, I definitely put SRI, social responsible investing, uh, products in that category, but they are not, you know, they are, they're, well, they're public equity. So they qualify for, in my mind, as impact, obviously, uh, but some people would say they're not the same thing as a, a public, a, a true public equity fund, uh, like an exchange traded product uh, around social enterprise specifically. Um, and then the final one is venture capital. And again, circling back to Vancouver, uh, Renewal 2, Joel Solomon's fund, uh, is an early uh, early growth stage, invest in early growth stage companies in North America. Um, and they focus on green building, green consumer products, and organic and natural food. <clears throat> $35 million uh, committed capital. And uh, that is for accredited investors, so, so uh, high net worth. So... A purpose capital client would be a, a typical uh, impact investor, uh, potential impact investor. And, and so typically, although there are a range of types of clients, it's, we're talking about uh, foundations, family offices that are considering this stuff. And these, this would be sort of the process, doing an initial, if you're a foundation or family office, doing an initial research piece um, around the impact space, uh, impact investing space. Uh, tied in with education for relevant stakeholders, whether it's the board, whether it's management, uh, the investment committee, developing and considering and or developing uh, a strategy, uh, implementing such a strategy, doing due diligence uh, and search based either for, uh, some, you know, for deal flow, essentially, um, and then metrics to be monitoring. And, you know, we are seeing... I think this is the future. I mean, clearly, I, I, you know, I'm a big believer in this stuff, and I, but I do think that there's some evidence uh, that points to this. I, I mean, I feel like foundations and others who have a fiduciary responsibility to organizations, I feel like at least considering this stuff is going to become the norm in due diligence. There may be organizations that choose to not go this route for legitimate reasons. They feel that they can fulfill their mandate with just the gifting portion. Um, but I feel that at least considering the capital, the impact of the capital piece. So you've got you know, this big pool of money that the foundation is sitting on, they gift this small amount. And to at least think through the process of whether some of that capital should be looked at in a lens like this, should be in, you know, in, a, in a product, uh, an SRI type product or some other market product for the capital base. And then for the non-capital base, for the gifting component, whether some of it could be used in a more generative way instead of just giving it away investing some of it, seeding some enterprise, trying to use it in a way. Uh, I think it's going to become a norm that, f that fiduciaries of these organizations consider this stuff, even if they don't go down that path. Um, and I think that the reason they're going to ultimately go down this path is because we're seeing, as we all know this, just unprecedented transfer of wealth. And the values of the folks that the wealth is going to be in the hands of have a different value profile than the folks that the wealth is in the hands of now. And so it is going to be, for a short time, mostly women. Uh, then it's going to end up in the hands of younger people. And, uh, and I read this amazing stat the other day, and I, I think it was 2025, but don't quote me on that because I've got it wrong. But two-thirds of global wealth is going to be in the hands of women. Um, and then, of course, it's going to end up you know, down the road in the hands of millennials, which are the biggest generation in the history of the world, you know, bigger than the boomers. So, and they have a very different uh, profile uh, around money, and that's well uh, documented. So, I think all this stuff is very exciting, and uh, and you'll be hearing more and more about it. <laughs>